All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam, and this panel will be about tracking emotions, as you've seen in the, in the booklet. Uh, I actually found out about State Festival when I was on an Air Berlin flight, and I opened up the magazine, and I was like, wow, that's cool, I gotta be there. So I contacted the, uh, the guys from State uh, Festival, and uh, they invited me over to moderate this panel, and I'll also be giving a workshop tomorrow. Uh, I think the panel will be very interesting. It's a very, uh, it, it's, it's a topic that's living at the moment. Uh, you see a lot of changes in the landscape. Uh, I am part of this change. Uh, so I'm part of a startup called 12 Grapes. Uh, and we are doing recruiting intelligence. And what we do is we measure micro expressions in the face and tonality of voice. Uh, and we try to fit people in an existing team based on values. Uh, in the United States, this is a large problem. People are leaving their jobs within a year uh, very quickly. Uh, the reason not because of skills, but because of a lack of values. So this is what we try to tackle by measuring these emotional metrics. Um, obviously, the tracking emotions is, is becoming more and more prevalent in society. I was at the Microsoft building in Prague about a month ago, and they have cameras all over their building uh, tracking micro expressions to see how people feel in the different rooms. Uh, they're doing this in their stores as well, uh, so for marketing it's used a lot. Uh, and today we have three speakers lined up uh, that are experts in the field, uh, who will be giving their talk and explaining what they do. First off, we have Maya Pantic. Uh, Maya's right here, and she uh, has a PhD in computer science, uh, which she got in Delft. And currently she's working uh, at Imperial College in London, where she is head of the iBug group. And IBUC stands for Intelligent Behavioral Understanding Group. Um, she is focusing on uh, the analysis of human behavior, uh, including facial expressions, body gestures, laughter, social signals, and affective states. So without further ado, a round of applause for Maya Pantic. Good afternoon, everyone. So today uh, we will be speaking about this technology that goes actually under really various names. Um, sometimes we talk about it as emotional robots because the technology is integrated within the robots. Affective computing is a very classical uh, term, but they really like this emotional artificial intelligence because in principle it is about uh, artificially or by machine understanding emotions and attitudes of people. So behind this technology is, in principle, automatic analysis of face and facial behavior. The face, the human face, is really fascinating if you think about it. So we are using it to uh, recognize other members of our species, but we also use it to judge various things, such as, for example, age and gender, beauty, and even personality. But what is really most important is that we are using it to analyze the inner state of uh, humans. So in fact, facial expressions and facial behavior is the only fully observable window to that inner world, to our emotions, our intentions, attitudes, and moods. So it is therefore not surprising when you think that if we could analyze automatically who the person is and how that person feels, we would be able to apply this to a very wide variety of applications, some of which I illustrate here. When we are talking about automatic recognition of people, so person identification, in principle, the state of the art is such that we can do this exceptionally well, even if the faces are occluded or under very uh, difficult illumination, for as long as those faces are upright, so in frontal view. Very similar is the case for facial expressions. So we are capable of tracking facial expressions and understanding different gestures like smiles and frowns, and even, as Sam mentioned, some micro expressions for as long as the face is in frontal view. 
We can even analyze some higher level behaviors, such as, for example, interest or boredom. Uh, but again, this is all possible for as long as we have more or less frontal view. But this is not the case when you go to the videos which people usually upload in YouTube and uh, Facebook in these completely unconstrained environments. Sorry about this we uh, still have great difficulty of understanding all those different uh, facial expressions. Um, so, in order to address this problem, we would definitely need a lot more data, data which is collected in such unconstrained environments. Uh, or from the videos uploaded in the wild, like in, on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, we would then be able to train models, facial models, to be able to deal with these drastic changes in head pose. I mean, when people say to you, we can uh, automatically recognize facial expressions and we can apply it for commercial purposes, be wary of that. This is not really true. They can do it for as long as you watch the camera. But in principle, if you start moving around, they cannot do it. Current technology cannot really do it. So we also need the much better inference models. Those are the models that would take the context into account. So not only who the person is, that's a very important contextual question, but also uh, where that person is and what this person is doing. So for example, if I raise my eyebrows right now, it means that this is important for me. I am emphasizing this point. But if you do it, it might be just a question, is it really important? So the meaning of the very same gesture will be completely different depending on the context. Currently, we do not have context-sensitive models. This is something we should be working on. However, even though the current technology is not really fully mature, and we cannot apply it in all possible applications. We can still apply it in many applications. A very successful application about which Elnar will be talking in a little while, he's coming from this company called Realize, is automatic analysis of successfulness of an advert or a product and how likely it is to be bought or to be sold based on behavioral reactions to different products and adverts. Another application on which we worked quite a lot is automatic analysis of pain. This is very important uh, application in medical purposes because if you would be able to recognize the pain automatically, you would be able to build different kind of therapies, automatic therapies, where people would be um, guided through these therapies uh, by virtual agents or robots or simply machines. And this, the reason for this is that we simply do not have enough personnel that could do that because our population is getting older, is aging. It's also that we are just having way too many people. And for example, in UK, we have a, a huge problem with lower back pain because most of the jobs are services. So people actually sit a long hours and they suffer hugely from lower back pain. In fact, 60 plus percent of people suffer from it at least once in a lifetime. So there is simply not enough personnel to help those people. So that's why this automatic uh, machine-based machine based therapies could help. This got uh, the attention of uh, IBM recently, and we are currently working on building a center uh, which is called Artificial Intelligence Empowered Healthcare, uh, where we want to have a, a remote uh, uh, consultations between the doctors and the patients. This is especially uh, the case for primary care because there is huge waiting times in UK where we have the waiting times from two days to three weeks for anything uh, what is wrong with you, which means that some people never actually come to, to the primary care and suffer uh, quite a lot. So in order to speed it up and speed these processes, uh, there are some um, 
current services that allow webcam-based consultations. However, the problem there is that um, doctors cannot really very well observe the, uh, the people uh, and they are not often familiar with people, so we want to change this and uh, to actually have automatic analysis of things like pain, for example, or fatigue. Depression is another one which is really important, but also to provide to the doctors the medical uh, records of the patient uh, with whom they are consulting, because currently they, in fact, do not have automatically these records available, which is really horrible. So we are currently working on that. Another, um, I mean, this was quite uh, a big topic and has been reported by the CBS, 60 Minutes, uh, just last month. And um, another topic on which we are working, which is also from the medical field, and it's quite a good uh, application of robots. You know, you probably heard about that. Um, usually, when uh, people talk about artificial intelligence, it's always this uh, classical um, trashing of the technology and uh, uh, also fearing the technology. So you will hear most often that the robots uh, will kill us all and have the war against us and all the movies are about that and like uh, there are very few things that say that this kind of technology can truly help us and this is a really good example so we are working with autistic kids the little ones who have autism cannot recognize facial expressions as we do because they miss gestalt gestalt is actually understanding of the face as a whole they understand or see the face as a set of parts so if you would change a very, very small gesture on your face, they would see it as a completely different expression, so they have a great difficulty in understanding our expressions. And also, hence, to learn how to express those emotions that we expect them to be able to express in a way we would understand. So in order to teach them that, we build this uh, system within the robots um, one robot at this point that uh, can show the expression and encourage the child to show similar expression as the robot does. And if the child does not succeed, try to actually motivate the child to do it again. So um, they prefer robots because of this consistency. So the robots never change this expression because they're programmed to show it in an exactly same way. Um, we are also working with IBM on another problem, and that's uh, the meeting analysis. They're very interested in having remote meetings between their own members. They're a very large company. They have 400,000 people employed in their company, but also with having uh, different meetings with different clients and so on. And often people cannot come to their premises, so they can do that remotely. But they're interested in things like um, what are the points of the meetings where people agreed, when people disagreed, where... Uh, um, they had a good discussion where people were enthusiastic and interested and so on. Um, this is very new. We are working with uh, a company that just started. It's called Lovelands. It's a company that provides the online video dating. This is the first company that provides dating based on videos as opposed to all dating sites which are text-based. Um, the video-based dating seems to be uh, preferred because people can see each other in uh, a very short period of time, and if they like each other, they can see each other again via that video or exchange phone numbers or whatever, and if they don't, they don't do it. Um, and this actually circumvent all these problems of uh, putting the pictures which are 10 years younger than people are currently, 20 kilo, kilos less, and uh, probably much higher, and so on and so forth. So uh, we are trying to help them with, with that. And the last uh, um, application about which I will talk is uh, in autonomous vehicles. Uh, we are working with Ford to try to uh, understand fatigue, stress, attention of the drivers. This is, um, um, I don't know if you know about it, but Tesla had a, a car crash uh, last, I think, April or something. And um, the main reason for this was actually non-attention of 
the driver. And although all the uh, instruments were telling that actually the camera uh, is blurred and cannot see what's happening, and hence that the cars start going under this trailer of a track passing by, um, the driver just didn't pay attention and uh, got killed. This got uh, really big uh, in the news and so on, so people need to find alternative ways of checking whether the driver is actually attentive to the equipment and the road. And so although we cannot uh, deal with all and every application that uh, is, uh, could be actually uh, or could benefit from this technology, we can uh, deal with quite some applications. This kind of technology is really interesting and important if you think about the future. The future is this fourth industrial revolution which is all about artificial intelligence and about robotics and about actually cognitive empowerment empowerment of people, meaning making people uh, people's life easier and giving them more information than they would uh, uh, be able to read or get in an easy and fast way on their own. So just giving them the, the information and uh, uh, the way of uh, dealing also with other people and just purely data. So... With that, I leave you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Maya. Um, the next speaker we have coming up is uh, Elnar Hajiyev. Let me know if I pronounce it correctly. Um, and Maya already touched upon it. Uh, she talked about real eyes. And, uh, Elnar is the co-founder of Realize, and before this, he also created the first online beauty pageant in Azerbaijan, which uh, attracted millions of viewers uh, and got nationwide coverage. And um, Elnar will be touch touching more upon the business side of things with regards to emotional metrics. Um, and I think the presentation should be up at any moment. Should be coming up, hopefully. There it is. Okay, great. Okay, a round of applause for Elnar. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, so, as Sam mentioned, I will be talking about uh, one particular application of emotion measurement today. Um, so, during this morning, we've spoken about the history of emotions and different ways of measuring emotions. And uh, what I would like to, um, to present today is... Um, a particular real-life application that is happening, has been happening already for quite a few years, and the value that emotions are already uh, giving to, to people and to companies um, that use this technology that we develop. So, I will be talking about a company called Realize that I co-founded uh, several years ago. And what we do is, um, in one sentence, we measure emotions to guide better marketing decisions. Uh, what does that mean? Well, um, I don't know if you know, but over 90% of human behavior is driven by emotions. Uh, we are emotional creatures. And for um, businesses, um, it is important to understand how people feel when they're providing their services. Um, and there's, there's more and more need to have an efficient measurement of um, emotional impact on people. And um, that's the service that we're providing. So let's take, uh, as an example, advertising industry. People don't hate, don't just hate the adverti advertisements. They hate really bad advertisements. The ones that interrupt during um, uh, watching something really interesting. Um, advertisements that are annoying um, and, and uh, popping up in, in, uh, in a, you know, not, not the best moment. Um, on the other hand, if an advertisement is uh, touching, uh, is uh, joyful, is engaging, that's something that people want to see more of, and that's some, something that people would be happily uh, sharing as well. So, so we're, we're helping uh, both companies to um, build, build better uh, video and creative content, and also, hopefully, um, that people get less of the kind of advertisement that they don't want to see, or videos that they don't want to see. So, how much, um, 
how much of it is already available and what, what is needed to, to measure how people feel when they're watching uh, a video content. Well, all you need really is a web camera, uh, a device with a web camera, um, and uh, a device that's connected to the internet. And then we can, uh, you can already participate in an emotion measurement study. And we've been doing that for years. We've uh, accumulated one of the largest databases uh, of recordings of people reacting to various kinds of video content uh, online in their, in their natural uh, environments. We have one, over 1.4 million uh, recordings uh, done so far, people watching more than 8,000 videos uh, across the globe in one, 187 countries last time uh, counted. And who are the companies uh, that are using this service? Well, there's an increasing, uh, uh, increasing demand in emotion measurement technology, and many of well-known companies and brands are using this technology. Um, companies like Adidas, uh, Procter & Gamble, Mars, uh, HSBC, Philips, and, and many others are using emotion measurement to make their videos better uh, that come out of their production, to choose the better videos to be used for advertising, um, to choose the audience that is more engaged and more interested in the video content that they're producing, and to evaluate overall emotional impact that they're making on the society when they're releasing their video content. So how exactly does that work? How exactly can somebody use our technology to measure the emotional impact uh, on an audience? Well, it all starts with the video that you want to test or several videos. You come to our platform, you upload the videos, specify the demographics that you want to test it with. Um, it can be as simple as just choosing the country in which you want to have it tested uh, or as sophisticated as providing uh, age, gender, and various other demographics parameters of the kind of audience that you want to target. Um, and then using uh, special online panels, uh, these are online databases of people who've subscribed to participate in such tests. Using those panels, we're able to invite them to take part in, in the studies. And all they need to do is, once they receive an invitation, if they want to take part in the test, they open it up in their browser. They don't need to install any special software for that. Um, we explicitly ask for their permission to have access to their webcam. Um, and after that, they watch the video and we record what their reactions are. All of that gets uh, transmitted to the cloud, analyzed, and in near real time appears on the delivery dashboard that our clients see. And when there is enough data collected, usually between 24 to 48 hours to collect uh, something around 300 uh, different recordings, then clients can start already making some, um, uh, some analysis of what the uh, audience is feeling about the video that they have. Um, to give you a little bit uh, better understanding, I'll show uh, a short video clip that explains how it works. Uh, so when people watching uh, a video, uh, our software registers their facial expressions, something that we've talked about um, quite a bit today. And those expressions then get aggregated and uh, shown on our dashboard. And there you can choose between different expressions. You can see what the results are second by second. Um, and generally, our, uh, our dashboard provides various tools for uh, people to analyze and, and uh, see the emotional response from different perspectives. Uh, so this is uh, how typically how the dashboard uh, would look like. You have here on the left uh, all the different emotions uh, that you can see measured in this particular study. Um, you can slice the data by, uh, let's say, gender, for example. You can see how uh, different genders react uh, to the same video content. Um, in this, in this uh, screenshot, there are two videos being compared, so you can compare the, the emotional reactions for two different videos. You can also refer to uh, a normative database, so it's a database of all videos that we have, so you can check how does your video compare to some of the competitor videos, for example, um, to, to understand uh, how well you are, you are performing. Um, so if we uh, so let's let's dive in and, and, and see how how would um, 
companies typically use this information when it's, once it's, bill collected, uh, it's been collected. So one example is that, of course, you would uh, pull up the emotions and then start zooming in at various peaks of emotions and see what's going on there. What kind of scenes in the video does it correspond to? And for example, um, if it's a peak of a negative emotion, then maybe you want to see that was this a desired effect that you wanted to have, or is this something that you were unaware of, and maybe this scene you want to change or cut out. Um, so that's one example. Another example would be to uh, see what's the overall trend of, um, for example, an overall emotional engagement. Uh, most of the time, uh, when, when you want to have an impact, an emotional impact with the video, then you would be looking for an upwards uh, growing trend. If, if, if your trend is upwards growing, then uh, you're doing the impact that, uh, that uh, you want to have. And you can see uh, what's, the, uh, what's the trend of uh, particular emotion or overall emotional engagement. Um, we also have uh, tools that um, based on uh, the emotional measurements that we have and, and emotion, um, particular emotional patterns uh, which, uh, we call, which, which we call attraction, um, engagement, impact. Um, uh, so, so all these combined together uh, in, a, in a simple scoring mechanism. Um, and using the scoring mechanism, you can see uh, and compare how different uh, videos compare uh, to each other in terms of the emotional impact. So this is what we call an emotional score. And here's an example of, uh, of an emotional score of five different uh, videos that one, one customer was, uh, was comparing. And you can see that clearly that CT Rivalry is, uh, is the top performer um, overall because it has the highest emotional score, but also in uh, the different countries where it was uh, tested. Well, in this case, it is uh, UK, Germany, and Spain. Uh, you can also see that um, while the other um, videos were less performing, uh, perhaps you have invested quite a lot of effort into producing these videos, and you don't want just to disregard them. Um, you, you want to try to see what's the optimal uh, way of um, uh, showing, airing the videos. And here you can see, for example, the uh, mission statement, video number three from, uh, from the top. Um, although it has overall low scores, in UK the score is almost as high as the top performer. So you could still go ahead with this video in UK and get quite a good emotional impact um, that you might be after. So these are some of the examples of how uh, the dashboard that, uh, that our product provides can be used. There's several other tools um, and um, mechanisms of, of analyzing the data, of course. Um, and people who usually work with it, they are, they are the experts. Um, they know exactly what's, what's the goal of their campaign, what's the goal of the video content that they want to um, air, and so they know how to best analyze uh, the, the, the results. But really, um, one question that uh, almost everybody is asking is, okay, so we have, uh, we have these emotions measured, and um, if, we, if we take all the complexity of the human behavior, um, and we try to analyze that, um, is there a way that we could show a link between the, the various kinds of uh, emotional behavior to the performance of the video? Is there a link that would, with confidence, uh, give us how a video is likely to perform? And by performance here, I mean, uh, for example, performance of a video on a social media. So how many YouTube uh, likes or shares would a video generate? Is there a way to try to predict that information from an emotional reaction of people? Uh, or another example would be if it is a social awareness uh, campaign. So is there a way to predict how many donations uh, with, will this campaign uh, create um, by the way that people are emoting and reacting to the video? Um, that's something that uh, we are in a good position to try to answer, although the question is very difficult. And the reason why we are currently in a good position to, to start looking into this question 
Um, well, because I believe um, there are several critical components that are coming together to help us answer this question. Well, first of all, over the years of working in this business, we have accumulated a really big database of uh, people's reactions to video content. That's, that's one of the uh, few unique databases, one of the largest databases in the world. And it's a database that holds a lot of secrets about us humans and about emotions. Uh, and about our behavior that are waiting there to be unlocked. Um, and we have that database, and we should be really looking and trying to understand it. Um, the other component is, of course, the, the, the classifiers, the algorithms that, uh, that can extract that information from, from the pure recordings, that can understand the different micro-expressions and different uh, movements of the face. That's something that we're continuously uh, working on and continuously improving our algorithms. And one of the projects uh, that Maya mentioned uh, is called SEVA project, uh, which is funded by the European Union, where we're trying to advance the technology of measuring human emotions, not only just from the facial expressions, but also un uh, analyzing the audio um, and trying to extract emotions from the audio together with uh, several partners uh, that were working uh, in this project. So that's one, one uh, building block. The other one is um, the videos themselves. So we have uh, over 8,000 videos in our database, and we, we have a, a lot of valuable performance information about this video. So some of the videos, we have information of how much they're impacting the sale. So once the video went on air, how much did the, the, an advertisement video, how much did the sales grow as a result of it? Or, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the social media performance results. Now, getting all these big databases together and leveraging the power of cloud computing um, that can scale to, um, to the levels that were unimaginable before, um, and advancements uh, in, in data science as well. So putting, putting these things together, we can start mining this database for new behaviors and try to find, um, find, new, find new behaviors um, as well as uh, make performance predictions. And this is something that we've already started doing. And we have built a model that can predict with 75% accuracy uh, whether um, an advertisement will have high or low sales impact, 78% accuracy, whether a video is going to be successful on social media or not, um, and 67% accuracy, whether um, a charity ad will, will be successful. And here, 67% um, may seem like a low score, but uh, if you think about it, these are all negative emotions, and they're much harder to, to track automatically. So I'm, I'm really... Uh, hoping that uh, the future um, of advertising and the 2020s looking that like that um, with better understanding of our emotions and reactions to, to video content and what really engages us, there will be less uh, advertising, certainly less advertisements that are unengaging and uh, not, not interesting. And my final slide, I'd like to, I'd like to finish with, uh, with a very relevant quote by um, American poet um, and social uh, rights activist Maya Angelou who said that people will forget what you said, uh, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Thank you. It's colder in here than I expected it to be. Uh, really, I'm sitting there like freezing a little bit. Um, so we had uh, Maya with the scientific background, of course, um, and Elnar more taking a business-like approach. Uh, the next speaker we have is Ruben van der Ven, uh, and he brings the creativity to the table. Um, he has a background in filmmaking uh, and in programming. Um, and he recently graduated from the Piet Swart Institute in uh, Rotterdam, uh, where he investigated com computational quantification and categorization of emotions. Uh, so here's Ruben, a round of applause. Thank you. 
Uh, first of all, I'm honored to be here at the State Festival with so many uh, uh, people looking into uh, emotions um, and, and doing research in that. I already learned a lot today from the talks this morning. And um, also the exhibition upstairs, if you haven't seen it, there's really, it's really cool to be among uh, actually some works that I last year had, still had references when I uh, had as a reference when I was developing the work I'm showing now. So that's really cool. Um, so that's, that's this work, Emotion Hero. If you haven't seen it, see it upstairs or download it if you have an Android phone. Um, so, um, well, over the one last about one and a half years, I've been looking into this technology. And, um, well, it's already introduced a bit by, uh, uh, by the previous speakers. And so I think I don't need to really get into uh, what, it, uh, what it does. Um, rather, um, I want to use my sort of background as being an artist researcher to sort of broach, um, to not stick into one field, but rather sort of use my knowledge from, uh, uh, borrow my knowledge actually from other fields and sort of combine it in one story. Um, also, I will take a bit more uh, a critical perspective while using that. Um, so. Uh, so um, the first thing I would like to uh, compare it to, I will make two comparisons to start with. Um, the first one is, uh, and now the presentation is working, so I need to get the video here. It's not showing. Should I just? We hear it. That works. Oh. <laughs> okay, that was. So the first uh, comparison is with the Kuleshov effect. And the Kuleshov effect, for those who know it, in the, uh, who don't know it, I should say, in the beginning of the uh, 20th century, Lev Kuleshov, a Russian filmmaker, did an experiment uh, into emotions in film. And um, what he did is that he edited the same phase into three sequences, namely that uh, of, uh, um, oh, that of a, a dead, a dead woman, a plate of soup, and an uh, attractive woman. And what he noticed is that if he showed that this clip to the audience, that in each instance the audience thought that actor looked really convincing and that he was looking very happy, very, uh, very full of desire, very sad, uh, very hungry. Um, and what is remarkable about that is that it shows us that, that emotions are, are recognized by humans in a specific context. Now, if we take, and I go back to my presentation now, if we go um, look how the software emotion analysis software looks at these uh, images, this is from Microsoft, and they break it down, pretty much all uh, software companies use the same uh, emotion skills, namely those by Paul Ekman, the seven emotions, and uh, it mainly recognizes it as a neutral face. It hardly sees any emotion there. You could say that interpreting the face as neutral is more precise than ascribing any emotion to it, because, yeah, maybe if you look solely at the face, it looks neutral. However, if we look at the context in, with the, in which the person is supposed to be, then he probably is sad, or he probably is hungry. So that context really uh, depends how we should read that face. And apparently, the software doesn't do that yet. Um, now, another example is this musician here, and he's picked up by the software as being very, uh, um, what is it, very sad and uh, very uh, angry, or somewhat angry. Um, whereas, if you're in the audience, you probably have completely different feelings. I mean, this one is not picking up any, any sense of joy, uh, pretty much. Whereas, uh, if you're in the audience, you do feel a sense of joy when listening to it and you ascribe, as an audience, that feeling on the person. Um, now, I haven't double-checked it with him, but I'm quite sure that there was a sense of joy when he was on stage. Um, now, what for me is important here, I mean, it seems a bit like I can just show another 20 examples of mislabeling uh, of the software, but that's not my point here. My point here is, is that these um, mislabelings are not just uh, accidental mistakes, but more fundamental to the procedure. But I will get back to that later. 
Um, first, I want to go to the, to the second comparison. And um, the second part, uh, I will look into the definition of what is emotion. Already this morning, it was pointed out, if you were at the talks, that the, emotion, the definition of what is an emotion is really troubling, that it's, you know, is what is an emotion, and it's a feeling, and the feeling is a fact, and the fact is an emotion, so it's sort of, um, it's hard to grasp what it is. And it's used in that way by, by psychologists, etc., in their daily practice. However, what happens if you try to sort of uh, delineate and quantify this, uh, this very vague and fluid term? Well, to get into that, I want to uh, showcase the example of hysteria, which was in the uh, end of the 19th century in uh, uh, France. Charcot was, uh, um, yeah, had a, a, a hospital for uh, females because uh, hysteria back then was seen as a feminine mental illness. And, um, and there he tried to sort of uh, research and cure hysteria in his patients. Um, but to do that in a scientific way, he needed to have a definition of what hysteria was. And hysteria, like I said, was seen as, a, as, as something that was feminine mental illness. Uh, however, that was a sort of, uh, uh, yeah, common use in, in everyday language. Um, and even though they did endless observations, really tried to sort of uh, uh, do a lot of data gathering, um, um, yeah, writing everything down. Um, the sort of the definition became really vague and all-encompassing because the um, yeah, it was as we know now a non-existent uh, thing that was trying to be captured. Um, also, photography in those days, which was a new new invention, and it was really seen as an objective technology. Um, it was thought that if we put people in front of a photograph, what it captures is highly objective. However, um, the, the camera might, might be objective in a way, but um, the, the, doctors, it's a, the doctors and the photographs, uh, photogra photographers, they, um, they sort of thought, uh, sought for specific cases that they want to have in front of the camera. And by preferring the de uh, deviant, they, um, they sort of encouraged the behavior in other patients as well. And through that, they sort of substantiated the, uh, yeah, the, the concept they were looking for. Now, if we compare that with, with emotion these days, you sort of see, um, might see something similar happening with this technology. That something which is, is Highly, highly fluid and, and hard to delineate. When it's tried to be quantified, uh, you need a, a concrete and a fixed definition. Um, what's happening though is that, um, no, I get back to that later. So if we look at these, uh, uh, these practices of data practices, can we compare it? And that's really a sincere question I have. Can we compare it to what happened uh, in a historical perspective with hysteria. That this immense gathering of data can be seen as, as, as a way to sort of uh, substantiate the act of labeling emotions. And labeling using the uh, seven emotions as defined by Paul Ekman, which I think are uh, uh, troubled in the fr uh, problematic in the first place, as was also pointed out this morning, that they are often uh, very context-specific and uh, uh, much more nuanced than those rigid uh, basic seven, as they are called. Now, why is this relevant? And um, over the last few months, I've seen already quite some anal uh, analyses of uh, Trump and uh, Clinton pop up in their debates. Uh, and sort of try to pinpoint who feels what and what does that say about them. Um, now, this is, uh, this is only a first instance, I would say, from a more uh, general use of the technology. As also uh, a few years ago, uh, research has been done using similar technology on CEOs, noting a, a, a correlation between facial expressions and revenue of a company. Now, if CEOs are aware of that and they have access to the technology, which they have because this is just, you know, in some cases just 
available online, then it's not, not unimaginable that they um, will start to use that technology to train themselves in their interactions. This might seem far-fetched, but it isn't, because already uh, a company called HireVue, they use this uh, uh, facial analysis, among other uh, attributes, to, uh, to find uh, people for job, to find job candidates. And um, simultaneously, the same company uses the, uh, the tool to um, train people to behave while in, uh, in a conversation so that they, they use a tool to find an objective truth while at the same time using the same tool to train people to, well, be, look better. Um, and that is, I think, the, in the end, the, the um, part of my story, is that if you look at, uh, at these images, which in this case are from Microsoft, but I think most, most companies use similar images to show that their tool works, you know, these people look really happy. Those, that man looks really surprised. However, if I see those images, I see stock photographs. And when I see stock photographs, I see actors, uh, people who act. And although it's often claimed that these technologies reveal what we really feel, I would say that these, in this case, it reveals what those people on the photographs set out to convey. Um, so, Um, I would say rather than sort of uh, uh, in giving us new insights into what emotions are and how we use them into our daily, uh, um, daily uh, interactions, it sort of reinforces an existing stereotype. So in the end, yeah, like I said, my question is, how do these practices uh, uh, of, of photography being a new technology seemingly objective relate to this new, seemingly objective technology, uh, or presented at least as being objective, um, uh, the cloud, so to say. Um, so, then again, as a final bit, I will plug this again, the thing you can find upstairs. And what's for me essential there is that if these tools are indeed used to train people, you sort of, the, the facial expressions become much more mechanical and actually the tool that in the first instance sets out to, um, well, uh, have autists, because I think it's pretty much started with autism research, have autists better understand emotions, have a general public uh, better understand each other, encouraging a more uh, uh, sincere interaction, actually um, leads to the opposite, namely uh, trained sincerity. So that's it, thank you. Okay, we have uh, about half an hour left, so 15 minutes will be a discussion between the four of us, uh, and then 15 minutes to get some questions from the audience as well. Um, what I find interesting while I was preparing my questions as well is that, um, these, the measuring of these emotional metrics, I can think of a lot of examples where it can benefit society as a whole. Uh, for example, the way we use it in our company, we try to match people on their value, and in the end, you have people working together better. Uh, same with the example you gave uh, with regards to the advertising industry. Uh, in the end, the goal is to get advertisements that positively influence uh, these people. Uh, but right before we started uh, the panel, we also talked about potential dangerous aspects of it. And Ruben, you touched upon it as well in your uh, presentation, where emotions can be context uh, dependent uh, in this case. Um, so this is the direction we can go in. Uh, for example, Eggman gives his, his seven basic emotions, uh, but emotions can be much more nuanced in certain cases. Um, and you see these large companies like uh, Microsoft, for example, that use put cameras everywhere where products are being sold or even in their office buildings uh, to look at the emotional reaction of a person there uh, in order to influence that positively. But can you maybe, what are you guys' thoughts with the, the sort of dangerous side of it? Uh, where do you think 
this can go wrong on like a large scale. Okay, um, first I think I, I would rephrase a little bit what was said. I think uh, Ekman has six basic emotions, the seventh one was never really confirmed. Um, these basic emotions are just expressions of these emotions, basic expressions which are actually not basic at all. Um, people in real world life don't react that way. So you can just watch YouTube or Facebook or whatever else you, you have videos that you will find very rarely these expressions. All the expressions you have shown are totally exaggerated. Um, so I think we should not talk about that really. It's, uh, but uh, uh, about the danger, um, I, I cannot see really if we say we will train people like this, uh, what, you, what you said about emotion here, we will train people to express in a certain way. Um, I think that is totally unnaturalistic. Un so in, pr in principle, if you would train people like that, I think that, uh, I think there is a psychological research on that as well. Uh, uh, we would see that as something which is exaggerated and non-natural and will actually not be trustworthy. So one of the things, for example, in negotiation, like for, for interviews and so, uh, what is really important is uh, how much we mimic each other. So, and there are people who know about that and start mimicking quite a lot. And this is like spotted immediately because you, you simply see that something is wrong, is not natural and hence we don't trust. So I don't think this really works. Uh, so that would be my comment so far. Okay. Okay. Um, well, dangers uh, is of course an important question. And like with any technology, there are advantages and disadvantages that come with it. Um, and there are dangers as well as the um, exciting stuff um, that is associated. Um, there's many things you can think about in terms of why emotions can be dangerous. Well, if you, if you can measure emotions and you can then understand how you can influence them, then, and you, know, you, you want to do it with some bad uh, intent in mind, then of course this is a very, very dangerous uh, avenue to, to go down. Uh, so that's, that's just one example. There are probably many more examples of how uh, motion measurement technology can be dangerous, but it doesn't defy the fact that there are also all these advantages that uh, have been mentioned, you know, ranging all the way from making videos better to um, helping autistic uh, children. So I think the important thing is that uh, we're aware of this, that we're aware of where the technology is moving, that we're aware of that, okay, now we have uh, this capability, that it's a long way to make it as good as humans are and bring in the context and bring in all other ways that we humans measure peop other people's emotions when we, when we speak. We don't just look at facial expressions, there are all sorts of other things that are happening. But it is already happening, it's already out there, technology is out there, and th the most important thing is that we start talking about it. Um, and if we talk about it, if we talk about the data privacy issues associated with it, the dangers, um, you know, and we start maybe working on the uh, respective legislation that becomes necessary for that as well, because now this technology is available, then, then we're on the right path, then we will be able to contain the dangers. Yeah, when, when talking about the dangers of the software. Is it yeah, I think okay. so. When we talk about the dangers, um, I, I wouldn't say some sort of uh, uh, Orwellian uh, uh, story is, is, is really the case. I mean, even though there have been proposals to use it in CCTV cameras, and apparently I didn't know about the Microsoft building, but even if it's used for surveillance, um, well, there's a lot to be said about it. Um, but for me, the discussion would be more at, at, at a um, fundamental level, namely, um, uh, the uh, the images that were shown, for example, they were from uh, 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 the way that the software is brought forward. I mean, they were all promotional images. 
So they were used to show that the technology works, which is what promotional images are for, of course. Um, but on the other hand, they do that through these quite stereotypical expressions. Um, now, in doing so, they sort of uh, uh, hide the fact that this technology actually, in its basis, has a lot of human labor in it. It's not some sort of magical work that suddenly happens and suddenly you have this software that gives you an ob objective outsider's view. There is a lot of theoretical assumptions underlying it. One of them is uh, uh, Paul Ekman's theory, which is sort of, uh, uh, I think, open for discussion already if we, uh, uh, from what I heard this morning. Um, on the other hand, it's also the procedure that goes into making the software measure faces. I mean, they, um, these, these, uh, the software recognizes fa uh, faces and facial expressions through a machine learning procedure. So there is a lot of data that goes in for, for a computer to recognize the expression and give it a certain label. It first needs to be fed with a lot of images showing that expression. That means that there is, at the first instance, already humans determining which expression is what. So there is, there's, even though it's, it's uh, as if it's shown that it's a fully automated procedure, there is already the uh, uh, human labor at the input. Um, so I think that sort of uh, uh, is left out of the story. I, have it, um, I read an article recently, because we are in the recruiting site, and um, this article was sort of uh, sketching out the, the dangers of, of these emotional metrics uh, taking over the hiring process completely. Uh, and what was suggested was that this should never be trusted uh, on its own solely, uh, these emotional metrics, again, because it's, it's, it's obviously context uh, dependent and uh, underlying assumptions can be you know, discussed in this place. Uh, so it should always be in conjunction with you know, something of an interview or a face-to-face -face, uh, talk to the person. Um, and this sort of leads me to my to my next question. I'm interested to see. I mean, it, it, it could be for all for all we know that this you know a robot or or some sort of algorithm will take over the hiring process completely. Um, we'll have to wait and see, sort of. Uh, but where do you guys see uh, see this? What paths do you see here? What do you see in the future? What can we expect in the next, let's say, decades or even even beyond? Um, do you have any, any thoughts? I mean, you're obviously in, in the field. Uh, do you, where, where are the developments, what directions is it going in at the moment? Well, uh, first of all, one, one comment about uh, these hiring process that you said and that we might want to wait and see. You don't actually have to wait and see. It's, it's already up and running on the fourth floor, I think. Uh, there's uh, a group of creative people who set up an experiment where uh, some kind of interview process, but done by a machine. So you can you can experience that today. It's not okay. it's not a full machine, but it kind of gives you the flavor. Um, and 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 the, uh, as I previously said, there's pros and cons, right? So um, you said that well, you know, there's always have to be a human involved in 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 this. You know, on one side, yes, I agree. On the other side. There's, the, there's this um, thing that when, when there's a human uh, involved in interviewing, then that human, uh, well, we all have biases. And so, you know, uh, if, if a machine makes some kind of objective decision, then you can perhaps make it, uh, you know, less biased. Of course, a machine is built by humans, so whoever built that machine puts in their biases in it. Um, but that's a, that's a separate topic. Uh, in terms of the future of this technology, um, I think I think it's undergoing very active development right now. Right now, it depends on where where you really want to use it. I think many of the technologies, um, well, you know, one thing that that comes to mind that everybody immediately wants to think uh, when talking about this technology is that oh right, let's let's create a robot that uh, that just comes and interacts with you like a like a human being. But for a robot to interact uh, with you like a human being, this technology has to be like another human. And it is not at that level. You know, you, you, we don't have the context, we don't have all these other modalities. So there's a long way uh, and uh, a lot more of research that needs to be done to get it to that level. So that's one of the 
directions where I think uh, this technology would be moving. But in terms of the the wide spectrum of applications, you know, this we Maya has presented a lot of different applications. These are medical applications. These are automotive applications, robotics. Um, uh, you know, we've we've been presenting um, measuring the the impact of um, creative content. So, so I think I think there's a lot of um, gaming is a huge, uh, huge mm -hmm. industry that everybody is really excited to to try to do that. And there's several attempts, but as soon as somebody tries to use it in gaming, it's like uh, it's not quite perfect yet. Um, so there's a bit of that as well. Yeah, let me just uh, say a couple of words about uh, uh, universality. You don't, you do not. I mean, emotions are not universal. Uh, construct as such. Uh, mm -hmm. They're context sensitive, they're culture dependent. Immediately when I say context sensitive, that immediately means culture dependent, in fact, person dependent, right? But uh, uh, there is something else. This is the facial muscles. So we all have exactly the same facial muscles. We may activate them with the different intensities and to the different amplitudes, but we all have exactly the same facial muscles. So if we mm -hmm. will be able, and that's like part of the research we are currently doing, uh, uh, to recognize those actions in terms of facial muscle actions, then the interpretation, which is higher level interpretation, in terms of emotions or attitudes or mental state or whatever you are interested in, is actually easier and uh, you can have a very objective system of tracking and recognizing the gestures up to that point. And then the higher level interpretation could be left actually to the next stage. Uh, and regarding the robots that would interact with us as human beings, uh, there is a very few applications for which this would be really relevant. So while I know like millions of people really would like to see that, for no other sake than to have this artificial intelligence really come to life, I do not see it at all as uh, anything purposeful. So, um, so I, I mean, a, a rob robotic nurse, sure, but even with a robotic nurse, there is a certain level until you will actually need empathy or whatever kind of a, of a true emotional engagement. Uh, so truly interacting with the robot in a fully human way, like this really, according to me, I'm sorry if I upset anybody, this totally ridiculous movie, Ex Machina, it's something which I cannot subscribe to. So it's, it's really uh, outrageously stupid. So, so. Okay. <laughs> Do you agree, Ruben? <laughs> Uh, do I agree with it? Um, yes, I think so. Um, <laughs> I, but I think the relevance is also uh, um, uh, why would one desire that that certain? Uh, uh, why would one desire indeed such a robot? I think that the applications of driver attentions, etc., are much more interesting mm. uh, to look at. Um, but then we, I don't know. Then it's doubly where we can talk could talk about it as if it's emotions. Uh, I think it's then something else, but that's, again, the term emotion being mm, maybe uh, mm. problematic. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think uh, we have around 15 minutes left to uh, have some questions from the audience uh, as well. Is there anybody? Yeah, we have one back there. How does this work with the microphone? Hi there. Hi, Pablo. <laughs> Thank you very much. The three of you were wonderful. It was um, three inspiring talks from the technology to the actual business and uh, obviously a very nice uh, approach from the arts to the current topics. Um, my question goes basically to Maya and Elnar. Um, what are the current uh, constraints in regard to um, legal uh, permissions or like uh, legislation, what is, what is happening at the moment? How, how much information can you obtain? Can you archive it? Um, is it? Is it a field that is, it's, is it growing? Um, are there countries that allow more of this information to be obtained and archived? Or um, 
what is what is in general the the what does it look like in uh, nowadays okay um when you work with this uh whenever you have um data collection, you need to acquire ethical permission and the pre permission of people uh, from whom you are collecting the data, so, which is great. Uh, however, as we know, uh, there are many companies, including uh, Facebook, Google, and Amazon, who do not follow this procedure and obtain your data just uh, by you using their applications. So that's dangerous. Uh, there are no legislation um, to prevent those companies to use that. So this is something we, we mentioned just before the talks. Um, this is something which is really important and people should uh, um, start working on that. And that is in which way we can truly protect our data, the data that, for example, you put on, uh, on your Facebook. Currently, these data do belong to Facebook and they can use it for whatever you want. WhatsApp is bought by uh, Facebook. All your conversations are also mined and used for the commercial purposes. So you lost your privacy. You don't have the privacy. So the issue is how we can get back our privacy. And the only way I see is actually using a kind of um, person identification technique which would be exceptionally unique, so definitely not the face, because the face can be tempered, it must be something else, uh, by which we will be able to tag this data and proclaim it our own, uh, and hence be only uh, uh, owners of this data. So this, for example, is one of the legislations on which should be worked. However, of course, companies like Facebook, Amazon, and Google are very much against it because this is how they make their profits. So we are currently in a kind of, uh, you know, local minima, what we will uh, call. I really hope it will not become a global minima. But uh, um, whether this would be changed or not, I do not know. However. I think this is a worrying issue and not what Elnar is doing or Ford is doing uh, with uh, watching people uh, for their own, uh, uh, for example, safety in case of cars or uh, uh, when they sign that their uh, reactions will be used for uh, these marketing purposes and they are aware for, which they, for what their data is used. Okay, so I'll give a, a quick and concise answer uh, to that question. Uh, for, for us, uh, it is very, very important topic because we know we're, we're working with uh, sensitive personal information. So um, there's several steps that we've taken to make sure that this is treated accordingly as well. So one is that, uh, of course, we're working with professional um, legal entities that have advised us on what we can and cannot do and uh, helped us to define the correct privacy policy and make sure that we're following it. Um, and, uh, you know, there are different legislations, for example, in the European Union, we're not allowed to uh, let this data to be stored on any uh, foreign servers um, or machines anywhere outside the European Union. Um, it was easier previously because we had the safe harbor agreement with uh, United States, but it was uh, made invalid. Uh, a year ago or so, and uh, you know, so there's there's few complications there, but that's something that we're following. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we also have very strict policies as um, in how the data is stored. So it's stored in a, in an encrypted way, um, and uh, unless uh, so, so there's no no um, the the access to that data is limited. Um, to only for the purposes of training the algorithms um, and so on. So this data is really, really treated very, uh, very carefully. And every time somebody is taking part in our tests, even though they have signed up to take part in such tests and so on, every time there's a request uh, to uh, from them to give access to their webcam, and there's a notice that uh, that their facial expressions will be recorded. So we're we're trying to make it 
as people as aware as possible of what we're doing, what data we're collecting, how are we storing it, and, and then on the other end, we're trying to make sure we store it as safely and securely as possible. I saw a question over here as well. Um, um, who's, ah, yeah. Hi, um, thank you very much for your talks. Uh, this question is for Ruben. Um, I really liked your link with hysteria and to your finishing statement of uh, that we could have a future with just uh, trained sincerity. I was wondering if you had any uh, proposals of like how to avoid this and do you have any alter alternative paradigms of how you could see a way as individuals or collectively that we can avoid the, that this happening or it increasingly happening, as I, I would say it's happening all the time, and I, especially in the universities, in this creative industries, there's all this, there's constant courses where I've studied as well, like how to promote yourself, how to mimic these, like you were also saying, these responses, and I think it's happening all the time, and I think there's such a nuance now in that in itself, that it is really hard to tell if someone's just being charming or is there integrity, and I think, I think it's, it's going to be more and more harder to yeah, differentiate what's sincere and not. And I was just wondering if you had any ideas of how to avoid that then in the future. Thanks for the question. Um, it's a very good one and it even uh, relates to then what would be sincere. I mean, there's other things that influence your behavior in public anyway. I mean, there's social norms. It's the whole discussion uh, that was already pointed out that uh, um, when we interact, there is actually a, a culture that influences our behavior. Um, so, my, my, um, I'm not sure what the response to that uh, uh, could be. I mean, there, there have been these projects to avoid uh, 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 facial detection in general, to sort of undermine that. Um, I'm not sure whether that's a really uh, uh, sort of that's more a statement than that it is really something you do in everyday use and I think uh, f for me now the first step would be a sort of awareness of uh, uh, of the influence for example uh, a few years ago uh, there was this Finnish researcher uh, Rückenstein who did who looked at uh, quantified self applications in this case heart rate monitors and how that sort of influences your behavior um, and that indeed the, the information that you get back, uh, that the measurements of your own uh, uh, heart rate, which is really minimal compared to facial expressions, um, already influences uh, uh, your behavior and you actually get an interactive relationship with it. So it's not that you take the um, information for granted per se, but if you see your heart rate, you sort of re-reflect on your day. like oh yeah, my heart rate was very high there, oh, I must have been quite stressed, or that you say, well, this maybe doesn't fit with how I felt. So that, um, for me, that the point is that the relationship you have with those numbers is not, an, it's not a, a concrete fixed one. I mean, uh, like I also write in my statement about my project, what does it mean to feel 30% surprised? I think that's a really an open question. Um, <laughs> And first asking that would be a good, I think that's a good step to go. I saw another question, yeah, right, right next to her. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, from an emotion researcher's perspective, um, I think you guys should let go of basic emotions. Uh, you've, uh, one, you're giving Paul Ekman way too much credit. Um, but there's like a lot of research you guys need to be thinking about. And in fact, I don't, I don't mean to admonish you, I think you should be the innovators and the leaders because you have big data, right? You should be telling us what facial expressions actually look like in terms of how they predict behavior. So I don't understand why we're even talking, what, is it because you can, when you pitch to VCs, you can talk, you can say happiness and you think that uh, that sells ads? As an emotion researcher, I don't, we don't know yet, right or slow, that what emotions map onto behavior. You're, you're using your own, like you're introspecting as a human. It's like, yeah, happy means good, right? That's going to make more sales. We don't know what emotion, how, that there's no one-to-one -one relationship. In fact, it's big data approaches that could be telling us these things or generative models that'll tell us like, 
This is the weird face that comes up that predicts when people are willing to accept an unfair economic offer. It looks nothing like any expression we've ever seen before. Um, so it is a, so this is a, more of a comment than uh, a question. I am partly admonishing you for talking about basic emotions, but I really think you can innovate in this way because you can mine the data in ways that can tell us what, you know, there's so much you have there that will be important for the real world and for you know, commerce, but also emotion researchers that we don't have access to this kind of, these kind of data. So, okay, here's the question in this comment. How important is it for your models to actually have disgust, fear, whatever? Why don't, I mean, I've done some modeling. I understand it's like, do you really need those as, as feature detectors? I mean, if you find a little bit of a head tilt is what really is the thing. I mean, as, as I understand it from com a computer science perspective, you shouldn't care what the features are that predict a behavior because you're not trying to explain emotions. You're like, hey, I can predict some economic behavior from a head tilt, but that doesn't fit into any of the basic emotion models. So how do you guys, you must have found these things, they just don't align with disgust or anger. Why aren't you t showing us pictures like, heck, Ekman, Darwin, they're wrong. These are the features that actually predict behavior. Um, so that's my comment question. <laughs> Thanks, thanks for the comment. Um, you know, very, uh, very topical. Um, I think, I think, I think um, Ekman's basic um, expressions is is um, is a framework, and it's a framework that is easy to understand um, and easy to begin with. And this is something that we started off with. Um, and there are all these reasons that you m mentioned as well why it is, good, you know, it's, it, it might be a good place to start. But you're absolutely right that there are all these different expressions and, you know, faces and head tilts and so on, which may have nothing to do with the basic emotions uh, while they can be predictive. And that's something that we started to do, as I was mentioning, and we're already finding such weird expressions or uh, behaviors. And then it becomes a question, did we really find a weird behavior and um, hooray, you know, let's, let's try to see what it is, or is this um, a chance, you know, it's just we correlated something with something and it isn't really uh, any useful behavior. It, it is a bit of a tricky territory and you have to be really careful there, but we are exactly onto things like that, so you're, you're absolutely right. It's a thank you for this comment. Um, so, they are not wrong. Ekman and Darwin were not wrong. There are, as you know, uh, Orton and Turner, for example, have shown that it is not the full expressions, but the parts of the expressions, which are actually universal. So, uh, the issue is that when it comes to Elnar, for example. I don't know for you, Ruben, but I know for Elnar. What's the issue is that they need labels. So they can label it with these parts of expression, which we talk about for a long time that they should do, or they, should lab or they could label it with those prototypic labels, right? And the second one is exactly what Elnar said. It's easier for, to, for people to understand, right? And somehow this is how it always ends up. Then they label with those labels, disgust, sadness, happiness, whatever, right? Uh, regarding the strange behaviors, we did find some strange behaviors. This is in, in collaboration with Realize. Uh, we now recorded six different cultures. The data will be available, so in, in case you are um, just a researcher, we uh, make the data available for whole research community. So we have something like 400 different people, um, six different cultures. Uh, one of the cultures uh, is Chinese culture, and it's really wonderful. They smile all the time. When they are happy, when they don't like it, when they hate it, when they are surprised, when they don't know how they should feel, they laugh all the time. It is just the way they laugh. 
and what are the position of the head and the eyebrows at the same time. So it's really wonderful data. So this is kind of the things we, we are finding out, but this you should understand for the big data uh, that they have to deal with. This is very difficult. We have just peanuts and everybody is constantly talking. Ah, you guys have uh, a lot of data. Why don't you do it currently? Deep learning. Everybody should go into deep learning and just deep learning is just one of the machine learning techniques. When you have masses of data, you can train deep learning methods and they will do wonders for you. But the issue is we don't have this data. So we have very little data with those specific strange expressions that are truly representative of, for example, a culture. So this is why they, one way or the other, end up in this, like, you know, basic emotion labels. However, I hope we'll move out of it, so we'll see. Okay, I think that uh, that is a nice conclusion to wrap up the, the panel. Uh, it's around four o'clock, so I wanted to ask for another round of applause for Ruben, Elnar, and Maya here. Thank you.